I now like to introduce John Berry, a historian and author of the New York Times bestseller, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history. To ground today's conversation, John will be presenting us a historical perspective on COVID-19, drawing parallels between the past pandemic and our present situation. We'll also hopefully have some time for questions. As I said again, uh, as I said before, if you go to our website, uh, pandemicpuzzle.stanford.edu, there'll be a place where you can enter your questions. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, thanks, uh, my pleasure. Uh, may not have time for questions, but if, if people uh, include them in the chat, I'll try to answer them by, by email. Uh, first, I wanna talk about the similarities uh, then the dissimilarities and then uh, the lessons. You know, obviously uh, in both cases, you have a new virus jumping species. Uh, both are RNA viruses. Uh, both infect the upper respiratory tract, making it easily transmissible, but they also uh, bound to cells and the lower respiratory tract, making it particularly dangerous. Uh, I might add most seasonal influenza viruses, ordinarily they will bind only to the upper respiratory tract. Uh, while the so-called bird flu viruses bind only to cells deep in the lung, uh, which is why they are not transmissible. But if they ever did acquire that ability, then you could have a, a very severe pandemic. Um, you know, 19 and 18 virus and COVID, of course, transmit exactly the same way. Airborne droplets, maybe some fomite, uh, both infect other mammals very easily. In 1918, uh, they found even seals infected. Uh, it's quite clear in 1918 that humans gave the virus to pigs and swine flu continues to trouble us. Uh, today, cats, dogs, other mammals, uh, there's a report in the Washington Post this morning that lions and tigers at the National Zoo, zoo uh, were infected with COVID. Uh, although both are primarily respiratory, both affected the cardiovascular system, uh, COVID perhaps more so. Both had significant neurological impacts. In fact, both affect virtually every organ and system in the body. Uh, in 1918, there's reliable army data uh, that in some camps, nosebleed occurred in 15% of the cases uh, and that there was bleeding in some instances from all all mucosal membranes and includes the eyes, ears, anus, vagina. This is some pretty scary things. Uh, both uh, generate a lethal cytokine storm. Both have long lasting effects. Uh, months after supposedly recovering, uh, Robert Frost wondered, uh, here it is as late as this, and I don't know whether I'm strong enough to write a letter. Uh, a more quantitative number uh, in Cincinnati Health Department uh, early in 1919 noted that an extraordinary number of prominent citizens who had recovered from influenza were dying from other causes. Later, it examined over 7,000 influenza victims who had recovered and found that over 5,264 of them needed some medical assistance. And without the benefit of modern scans or blood markers, it also found 643 had heart problems. Uh, you know, for a good nine months after the pandemic receded, there were significant measurable uh, excess deaths from, from all causes. Uh, in both 1918 and today, also in 1889, 1957, 1968, 2009, uh, variants emerged, which caused waves more dangerous than the initial wave. This was most dramatic in 1918, e even more so than what we're going through today in, in Delta. Uh, 1918 also evidence suggests that variants uh, with very similar mutations uh, emerged almost simultaneously on different continents. And, and that seems to be happening uh, today. Uh, another similarity, uh, the response of too many world leaders uh, was similar to that of, of the White House or Brazil this year. The motivation was quite different. We were at war. They were afraid it would affect the war effort. But nonetheless, the, the uh, impact was, was similar at the beginning. 
uh, dissimilarities. Uh, the reproductive number for 1918 was probably about 1.8. Uh, before Del uh, the Delta variant, uh, the reproductive number for uh, COVID was probably two and a half thereabouts. Now it's estimated to be five to eight, which is an extraordinarily high number, as you all know. Uh, lethality, 1918 was much, much more lethal. It probably killed between 50 to 100 million people, which if you adjust for population, will be 225 million to 450 million people today. Most probably bacterial pneumonia killed um, a majority of the people, but even today the case mortality for bacterial pneumonia following influenza is six to eight percent. And if you, uh, it's, if it's a staph, if it's MRSA, it's around 30 percent today. So even if you had no problem with the supply of antibiotics, even if no antibiotic resistance developed, uh, even if the healthcare system survived uh, and was not overwhelmed, you, you were still looking at, if you had an equivalent virus, at least 75 million dead and probably considerably more than that. In 1918 in the West, the case mortality was about 2%. In the rest of the world, it was probably 6 to 8%. Uh, it's not because medical care was any better. Uh, but because in the West, people have been exposed to influenza viruses and had some cross protection. In virgin populations who had never seen influenza, the death rates were extraordinary. Uh, to give you a single example, in the Fiji Islands, 14% of the entire population died in 16 days. Uh, another difference between 19, uh, influenza and today, asymptomatic spread. Influenza does have significant influenza uh, asymptomatic spread, probably about 30 percent. Uh, it's much higher than that, as high as 59 percent, according to the CDC, uh, for COVID. The age of the victims is quite different. In 1918, kids under 10 were the most vulnerable. They died at extraordinary rates. And the second most vulnerable group was otherwise healthy young adults. Uh, metropolitan life found that 3.26% of industrial workers aged 20 to 45 died. That wasn't case mortality. That was mortality. Over 3% of the entire population of, of factory workers in that age group died. Uh, pregnant women, studies of hospitalized pregnant women, uh, case mortality ranged 21% to 71%. Uh, you could die very rapidly sometimes. Uh, first rate observers recorded deaths in less than 12 hours, sometimes horrific symptoms. This obviously had some impact. The medium was the message and the medium was daily life. Uh, although national and local uh, leaders generally tried to downplay the pandemic, again, because they uh, it would distract from the uh, war and detract from the war effort. Uh, they often told outright lies, said things like, this is ordinary influenza by another name. Uh, but the experience that people were having in their life, seeing neighbors die rapidly, people, young people, children, uh, people paid no attention to what they were being told. Uh, there was a tremendous amount. Uh, there was virtually no political pushback against any of the control measures. There's been a lot of attention in the media today to isolated instances of uh, mass protests and so forth in 1918, but that was really quite unusual in special circumstances. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, I live in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, uh, People were risking their lives and refusing to be rescued unless their pets would also be rescued. And the Coast Guard actually changed their policy on that because of it. By contrast, in 1918 in Phoenix, uh, rumors are spreading that uh, dogs carried the disease and the newspaper is writing that Phoenix will soon be dead, dogless because people were killing their, their own pets. Uh, and what minor pushback to control measures did occur, it was entirely nonpartisan. But perhaps the dissimilarity most relevant to us 
what we're going through right now uh, is time. Everything about influenza moves much faster than COVID. The incubation period, how long you shed virus, serial transmission. Uh, 1918 was an extraordinary extense time, intense period. Probably two thirds of the deaths worldwide occurred in a period of 14 or 15 weeks. And in any particular community, it was probably much shorter than that, often four to eight weeks in any particular town. Uh, so any control measures that were imposed were usually for a much shorter period. Is, you know, that intensity was greater, the fear was greater, but in many ways, the stress today, certainly the economic stress is actually considerably greater than what was experienced in 1918. So uh, what are the lessons? Some of them may actually be clinical. For example, it's not at all clear that either H1N1 in 1918 or, or SARS-CoV-2 infected all the organs that affect it, affect, infected as opposed to affected. You know, strongly suggests the immune response. Now you might say, we already know that for, for COVID, uh, but knowing that it occurred in both pandemics uh, may be useful in preparing for the next pandemic and, you know, in terms of therapeutics. Uh, also in 1919, 1920, the medical community was well aware of lingering problems. There is a lot of data out there uh, that I did not get into in the book. Uh, it's possible if some investigator wants to look that there might be some clues that are relevant to long COVID. Uh, but in a larger sort of a macro sense, as far as the lessons, uh, I think the main lessons from 1918 have been confirmed. Uh, I've been quoted many times saying that the number one lesson from 1918 was to tell the truth. Uh, again, I think that's been confirmed. The second lesson, is that public health measures, so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions actually work. Uh, these two lessons are intertwined. Uh, NPIs will only work if people both use them and sustain that use over a period of time. In a free society, that's only going to happen when the leadership tells people the truth, convinces them to cooperate. Since COVID-19 surfaced, the leadership of some nations did that. Others didn't, and the mortality is, is pretty clear. Uh, other lessons, not just from 1918, uh, but from the past 20 months. For 15 years, I gave talks and raised two questions. In 1918, if you were a doctor or a nurse, you knew you were gonna face infectious disease. That was part of the game. So I wondered, and it was a real question, if healthcare workers today faced a infectious disease, even if they had the courage to do that themselves, were they willing to take that risk, transfer it to their families and so forth? We didn't know the answer to that. Now we do know that healthcare workers behaved in truly heroic fashion, particularly in those periods before they had PPEs. The second question we still don't have the answer to. Let's say public health experts got everything right. How do you get a president or a governor to listen? Is there, and, and take their advice, is there some governing structure that might increase the likelihood that a president follows the best available advice? Um, there may be, I've thought about that a lot. I even have a proposal I'm not gonna discuss here. Uh, but we have to do better than we did this time. Uh, two final points. Uh, and one is, is really a question. Uh, in 1918, the first wave was very mild. Uh, the British Grand Fleet had 10,313 cases out of 90,000 sailors. They only had four deaths. Yet that first wave provided up to 94% protection against illness in the second wave. By comparison, the best influenza vaccine that we have ever developed was 61% protective. Usually it's in the 40s. On occasion, it's been as low as 10%. But that first wave was not very transmissible. 
uh, to quote a contemporary, probably the best contemporary review published about 10 years later, said the first wave lacked the penetrating power of the second wave. It had a tendency to peter out. So there was no pressure on the virus to escape immunity. The second wave did penetrate everywhere. There was evolutionary pressure on the virus to escape, and there was another wave. And interestingly, neither first wave nor second wave exposure to the virus provided any protection whatsoever to illness or, or death in the third wave. So we have to wonder if that's a precedent. You know, so far Delta has outcompeted every variant that has demonstrated the ability to escape immune protection to a limited extent. None of them have done very well at es fortunately escaping immune protection. But not too long from now, we're gonna have well over 90% of the population in fact, either having been infected or vaccinated. Uh, will variants then emerge that escape protection? What are we gonna do about it? Uh, I mean, how many annual deaths are gonna be acceptable uh, as we learn to live with this endemic virus? Uh, finally, to end on an optimistic note, there is a theory, which I am not particularly an adherent of, nonetheless, it's interesting, and I hope it's right. Uh, the theory is that the 1889 pandemic, which was pretty severe, more so than 1957, 68, or 2009, uh, that that was actually caused by a coronavirus known as OC43. And OC43 today causes the common cold. So let us hope that in that case, history is a precedent. Uh, and that's what ends up with uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, finally, Hegel said, what we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. We need to prove Hegel wrong. We need to learn from this and act. Thank you. John, thank you very much. Uh, I think we have time maybe for one question. And um, in the great influenza, you speculate that uh, how the 1918 pandemic affected President Woodrow Wilson's treaty negotiations to end World War I. What are some of the ways that you see the COVID-19 pandemic shaping the policy decisions and priorities of world leaders? Will COVID-19 push us to become more cooperative and integrated internationally or more isolationist? That's a very good question, and I can only speculate. You know, there are pressures pushing in both directions. You know, the obvious right answer is more cooperation. Uh, and, you know, maybe that will happen. Uh, I think one thing that the Trump experience should show any politician in the future is that it is in the self-interest of the politician that they handle things well, and that maybe they are candid. The only time in Trump's presidency that he cracked 50% approval was right after he said we were at war with the virus. And he did unify people in, in that sense. People do rally around a leader. Uh, so if it's in the self-interest, if it's demonstrated that it's in the self-interest of, of even the most selfish politician, to do things right, then of course that will lead toward more cooperation. Uh, but frankly, I'm not overly optimistic on that point. Okay. Well, thank you very much, John, for that enlightening presentation and for the way you've educated us all through your writings and your books um, and, and the great influenza, but of course, uh, prior to that rising tide and so many other contributions that you've made. Thank you.